How did a design team that created this then turn into this and this and this? And ultimately, how or why did this become one of the most recognizable chairs in the history of furniture? The answer lies in the creativity, innovation, and vision of one of design's most influential power couple, the Eames. In World War II, the US had a problem. The country was in total war. That means basically all resources were funneled towards the war effort in Europe and the Pacific. Even fashion took a hit in the 40s. Suits adopted a decidedly pragmatic tailoring style, close to the body with small lapels. The demand for resources during World War II changed the way that people dressed all the way up to the 60s. And a rebellion of that conservation effort was what led to the Zoot Suit riots and Christian Dior, but let's not get off track. World War II was bloody. Field medics transporting wounded soldiers were struggling with the metal leg splints of the time. But 80 to 90% of the wounded received medical care within 10 minutes of being hit. They were too heavy. They potentially caused further injury because of how restrictive they were, and the metal they used was an extremely valuable resource at the time. The US Navy was looking for a factory, a team, anyone who could help solve this problem. Enter Ray and Charles Eames. The couple first met at the Cranbrook Academy of Arts in 1940. Charles Eames entered the school on a design fellowship but soon became an instructor as Ray was looking to expand her grasp at the school after studying and painting in the style of abstract expressionists in New York City. And you know how it goes. Two creatives meeting at the same school. It was a match made in heaven. See, a lot like the Wassili Fasili chair in my previous video, the technology to create this didn't exist yet. Wood is rigid, it comes in planks. Despite being organic, its application is always very linear and very non-organic. Wood can't be used in a curved line, it has to be straight pieces. It was at Cranbrook that Charles first attempted to reimagine this wood constant. Entering a design competition hosted by the Museum of Modern Art, Charles submitted a chair molded by a single piece of plywood and he and his partner ultimately won first prize in the competition. But Charles considered it a failure because his chair could not be mass produced. And that distinction will mark much of the work that Eames couple will create in the following years. In 1941, Ray and Charles were married in Chicago. And for their honeymoon, they decided to drive from the Midwest to Los Angeles. And when they got there, they decided to make it their personal home. One of the reasons they chose LA, I read about in an interview once, was because they felt like Los Angeles didn't have a concrete artistic identity. In the 1940s, it wasn't the LA we know today. Essentially, it was kind of like a blank slate, especially compared to New York City, where Ray was working or studying as a painter. Here in LA, the couple found work creating props for Hollywood, but Charles continued to work on refining his process with plywood, trying to make it more moldable and easily reproduced. But the luxury of art and design came to a crashing halt when the US entered World War II. In this moment of necessity, the Eames saw a golden opportunity. The Navy was offering this grant to anybody who could fix this splint problem, and they were already trying to work on perfect a technique of molding wood into more organic, more usable shapes. So they applied and won the grant from the Navy. They would create the splint out of plywood. It would be lighter, more flexible, and allow them not to use metal. With wood veneers, the process used resin glue to bind the pieces, and they were able to mold the splints into rounded shapes with heat and pressure. The new wooden splints were a success, as well as a marvel of modern technology and design. 
after the war had passed and the Allied forces won, the dynamic duo were able to quit their day jobs and start the Eames office, a design studio in Venice, California. Their mission statement was, we want to make the best for the most for the least. And that ideology ran through their newest designs, like the Eames molded plywood chair. See, today, we typically associate the Eames designs with luxury, in part because they are beautiful, simple designs that still resonate with modernity today. But luxury was not the intention of the Eames office. Instead, they used their design philosophy and technique to make affordable furniture that was able to be mass produced. The molded plywood chairs are a result of a uh, working with a mass production technique and mm -hmm. in a way letting the mass production technique show through in the result. It was important to them that their designs were accessible and useful. And this drive to use modern technology for practical applications led to the application of another novel material, plastics, with the creation of the fiberglass armchairs. In the case of the plastic chairs, it's uh, the object was to take a material which was a high performance material developed during the war and try to make it available to uh, householders at non-military prices. Uh -huh. This design is so practical and has become so ubiquitous that even me, shopping for the cheapest chair set that I could find on Amazon, ended up buying a clearly Eames inspired set for my apartment. This is a testament not only to the legacy of the design, but to the fact that the Eames were really focused on creating pieces of furniture that would serve the purpose and could reach a larger audience. And it's very practical, is it? Uh, well, they made shock helmets out of it. Uh -huh. That would be pretty good. How did we find ourselves eventually at the iconic lounge chair? Debatably, the ultimate <laughs> lifestyle flex. The lounge chair is a decidedly luxury piece of furniture with luxury materials, and it still carries a luxury price tag today. Why did the practical and pragmatic Eames couple end up making this higher end piece of furniture? The answer lies with their eventual partnership with the furniture brand, Herman Miller. A furniture manufacturing company founded in the 1920s in America. Herman Miller shifted their focus after the Great Depression to modern and more upper class designs. The furniture company offered a contract to the Eames to produce all of their furniture. In a lot of respects, this was a fruitful partnership for both teams. The uh, Herman Miller Furniture Company has never ever uh, requested that uh, we do pieces for a market. The Eames getting access to Herman Miller's production and Herman Miller getting the rights to create the Eames designs, furniture that would shape the legacy and aesthetic of Herman Miller for decades to come. Today, if you want an official Eames piece of furniture, it is still produced by Herman Miller. By the 1950s, the American middle class was experiencing a period of unprecedented prosperity. And Herman Miller was interested in marketing a new luxury chair to this well-to-do middle class. Turning to the Eames couple, they devised a modern take on the classic club chair, much like how the Wasili chair was a modern take on the classic club chair, if you remember. It would integrate luxury materials with the Eames signature futuristic wood molding process, and the chair would have its big debut on this newfangled fad called TV. This chair is a familiar one to you. But 10 years ago, when it was designed by Charles Eames, it was a revolutionary new chair, and I must say it caused quite a flurry. And the designer Charles Eames has become almost a household word. Pause for a second. You hear what's going on? Only Charles Eames is mentioned by name. It must have been something very important that's brought you to New York. What is it? You know, it'd have to be important to bring us away from home. Uh -huh. uh, we're in New York to introduce a new uh, chair for Herman Miller. Did you notice the way Mr. Eames said our and we? Well, uh, that is, of course, because almost always when there's a successful man, there is a very interesting and able woman behind him. Interesting 
and able, but as if the work is separate from her, like it's just Charles's work. And a better case could seldom be found than in Ray and Charles Eames. Come on in, Ray. Hello, I'm so happy to see you. This is Mrs. Eames, and she's going to tell us how she helps Charles design these chairs. How do you manage that? I think the most difficult thing is to keep the big idea, to be able to look critically at the work. But actually, sure this applies to everyone in the office, including Charles. Yes, well, I think it's the best, uh, it's almost the best thing to have in a working family is a critical viewpoint of your husband's work. Your husband's work. I think that this is a really interesting video, not only because it's the premiere of the lounge chair, but it illustrates something that was unfortunately very true throughout the Eames career, that Ray Eames was considered an accessory by media, by Herman Miller, when in reality, she was very much an equal partner. Anything I can do, Ray can do better, Charles once said. After all, we're talking about a modern painter, an artist who is often credited in retrospect with applying the human touch to all of the Eames designs. Charles wouldn't have been the iconic designer if it wasn't for Ray, and vice versa. It's a shame that during this era of their creation, she wasn't recognized as an equal partner. And with the debut of their most iconic, potentially most artistic and human design, we should not dismiss that it is likely a lot of Ray, the artist first, that made this possible. But I think now it would be very nice if we can preview your newest chair. Why don't we just go up here and have a little preview of this? Well, that is quite a departure, Charles, and it looks wonderfully comfortable. Tell us something about it. The Eames lounge chair was a departure, notably more comfortable, more upper class, as all their designs served a specific purpose. The Eames said, in this instance, the need was a special refuge from the strains of modern living. And it's poetic in many ways that the couple's design philosophy would lead them to this. Their most impactful design would be born out of a necessity of modern life during peacetime. You know guys, I can't help but think of today. In a lot of ways, World War II is comparable to the pandemic we're facing in the United States. In terms of economic destruction, loss of life, and unfortunately we're not out of the woods yet. As we rise out of this calamity, in the years to follow, Maybe there will be a new Eames couple, born out of a necessity to offer a refuge for modern life. So guys, that's the video, duh. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Sorry, I don't have an Eames lounge chair. If you wanna send me one, I'll give you my address, so feel free to. Thank you everybody who responded so positively to my previous video. It was hard to make, like I said, I was really insecure, but I'm really blown away by your positivity, and I hope that you find it useful. Otherwise, I will catch you guys on the flip side. Take it easy. I did not know anything about the Ames chair or Herman Miller or anything before I came here.